Good morning, ladies. Good morning, viewers. Good morning, one. And good morning, all. <laughs> it's another day on Jessiri where we bring you the conversations that matter to you. The ones you know about and the ones you may not know about. And as it should. But today is no different. Later, we will be looking at uh, the attempt to repeal the 2015 VAP Act. But before we go into the main conversation, ladies, I saw this rather interesting post and I would love to get your opinion on it. Now, the Australian government has announced its plans to ban children from using social media with the minimum age limit of 16 years. But let's hear it from the horse's mouth. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, had this to say. Let's hear it. This one is for the mums and dads. I know you're worried about the impact social media can have on young children, and so am I. That's why we'll introduce legislation this year for a minimum age for social media. I want kids to have a childhood. I want them off their devices and onto the footy field and onto the netball courts. I want them to have real experiences with real people. Together, we can get this done. Honestly, I almost said, go, go, tiger. <laughs> I'm so up for this in Nigeria. I don't know, maybe I'm overreacting. When I saw this yesterday, I was like, this is a welcome development. Aside that I like Australian draw, but okay. yes. so, I had to put that out. There. Please don't let me stress myself too much. No. Please let me quickly talk, you know. So when you sent it to the group yesterday, I went to go and look at it, and I understand where the drive is coming from. But some of the considerations is how do they legislate this? You know when you're signing up for social media um, accounts, you're supposed to have an age. age limit. People lie. Yeah. A lot of kids are lying. They're not the age they say because social media platforms set age limits. Some 16, some 18. I think the majority are 16. People lie to get on social media. I don't think this is a legislation thing, even though if that's what they want to do. I think this is a parenting thing. Yeah. I think it's a parenting failure on the part of many parents when it comes to social media. Let me hold my voice. So I, I think that there are um, technicalities. Now, I would say that this is a welcome development. But then again, it's like two sides of a coin. But when it comes to lying on, I, I know of certain apps that you need your uh, uh, identification, consent. not even oh. parental consent, maybe your license or whatever, something that, that verifies... Know. Yeah. The main ones you don't. Yeah, so so I'm saying if, if there should be a way that that can okay, be implemented. That, be, that you, I mean, it's it's an app that was created by someone else, but there are some tweaks that you can make on it. For you to sign up, you have to have your, not just write your age, you have to upload something, Maybe a certain something. document that would, yeah. because that way it's no longer on the parents or the government. It's mm -hmm. now on you. If you're not up to the age, you're not up to the age. Mm -hmm. If you want to lie, you have to go through extreme measures. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'm going to say that. Now, um, I, I understand that there are... Um, opportunities online mm -hmm. let, let's be honest but right. i feel like the dangers outweigh the opportunities yes, there are i mean there are children now who are 15 14 who are self-made billionaires mm -hmm. you know their videos just go viral on mm -hmm. social media but then again let's consider that in the western countries now the rate of suicide and i'm not talking among adults i'm mm -hmm. talking about children, children 11 10 9 year olds why because of peer pressure because of comparison because of online bullying has skyrocketed so there's that to contend with there's there's also uh, the fact that there is now limited time for social interaction and when yes. i say social interaction yes. i'm even talking about boiling down to the family you yes. see everybody sitting at the dining and you don't even know what, your, what the color of your mother's dress is because everybody's on their phones oh drop your phone and, and have your cereal now i'm coming mom and everybody's just on their phone and it's just a fast-paced world when you're out of school you don't know because you're all you everything is on your phone so i think that it's an idea that I buy into 100%. And I know that if they want to implement it, there's a way that they will go about it. Jesse, it's, buddy, it, it, it's, you uh, have my For me, I would say that it's, um, let me take the umbrella swoop on this <clears> thing. <throat> if it can be done in Korea, North Korea, it can be done in... Uh, don't mention North, it, North no, Korea. Well, if it, well, if it can be done in Aziz, Asia, uh, it mm -hmm. can, if it can be done in Asia, it can be done anywhere. It takes discipline. I hear you, Tolu, when you say it's a parenting failure. And I hear you when you say, listen, this it would be the wel most welcome development ever. Everybody needs to play a part in this. For me, mm -hmm. that's what I think. And blessings, you're so absolutely on point because in families now, people really rarely have dinners together, rarely have lunches together. Okay, let's say lunches because everybody has different schedules. Yeah. But dinners, everyone's on their tabs. Mm -hmm. I know African parents or Nigerian parents who have broken their children's phones. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Just broken because they say when you are on that thing, you don't hear anything, yes. you don't yeah. see anything. Yes. This would be such, and I think it can be done. Okay. And it would be, it would set a precedence yeah. that this is a ripple effect that can now take over across yes. countries and, yeah. and countries. So, so I could cool. almost like look at everybody, I'm like, oh, French girl, I love you, uh -uh. buddy, I love you. You're so on my side on this. We're going to go outside oh. after the show. I'm not necessarily on side. Uh, support. <laughs> we'll carry placards and say, honestly, I have seen the harmful effect of these things. Yeah. I actually did see a video of a little girl about, let's say, two. She was sleeping. But even as she slept, she was, eh? she was still swiping a tab. Even as she it slept. Was, so yeah, she was, was uh, you know what you say, um, she wasn't sleepwalking. But she was just she was I, I don't think there was a out tab, just in her, her tab. Oh, in her tab. No, on, as if she was still on a social media, she was swiping. Head. And a doctor was saying, you see this, even our children's brains are, are, being are, being rewired. Rewired. are we being yeah. rewired. Yes. Visual, I see parents, I know it's hard for us to keep our children engaged. Even in my own home, adult child, I know how many pots have burnt this holiday. Mm. Turned to ashes from wow. their cooking. They Making could, rice, um, but look, this is you're better. Quite, you're quite lenient. Be burned and the pots are no, burnt. But no, I just made sure that the pot you burn, you cook with it only. So, 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 okay. so, so sorry, because this thing you said, I saw on social media, I, I think that girl, that child wasn't more than two years old. Mm -hmm. They took the tab from her. She, and she was vibrating. Wild. Wild. So <sighs> it is an addiction. And I think parents need to understand that social media now is an addiction. Yes, it is. People yes. are now getting treated for social media addiction. Have you not gone it is to, the, to... Sorry, it yeah. is the... It is the way you set them up as a child that they will grow Continue. into yes. as an adult. And limiting or even restricting. Now psychologists are even saying, don't give them any access to their 16. Yes. When we went on vacation, there was a small girl in a stroller. So you imagine the size of a child in a stroller. Yeah. She was on her parents' Instagram. All I was seeing is this. I, I did like this to me, so I don't go. Yeah. This girl just... <laughs> I, I was going to tell you Instagram that. Instagram is inappropriate for a child. What is she doing it's on Instagram? Totally you know, this thing, I was going to tell you, I was going to ask you ladies, how many times have you gone to events? You host events, you host events, mm -hmm. we all host events. How, how many times have you gone to weddings, events, corporate settings, even parental, what do you call it, open day parent teachers forum? Yes. yes. And you go with the younger ones who are just, and you see a parent just carries the phone and gives the child yes, just for the child to be quiet. Yeah. quiet. I see that a lot. Yes. And the child is quiet and the child is focused. I say nothing you say to that child. You will never will hear. make sense. And that I really think parents sense. should know that this is not a class thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's, a lot of yes. parents have seen it as an aspirational thing. No, it's not. Like, oh, so that they will know that my child is bougie. Tab, yeah. They know that my child is well retabled. All said, those things. It is no. a parenting failure. Yes, yes legislation yes. will support, but parents have to do the do work, the work. Yeah. at home. So I, yeah, yeah. so I think that the, the major um, aspect that the, uh, or the major role that the parents even need to play is not giving them access in the first place because i would Absolutely. say that 100 mm percent -hmm. after that it's not exactly the parents we've seen situations where parents you see that that thing that they say is what they train you in your home that train you train a child it's not always it's not like that anymore because now there's on learning and relearning yeah. i can learn from you as a parent and then i go online maybe my parents they're teaching me oh you need you need to learn to cover up as a decent girl and then online they're like body positivity show yeah. it out yeah. and then i'm unlearning everything my parents are teaching yeah. me That's just because point. i want to confirm what's happening on social media so i think that majority Majority of, of the responsibility of the parents is regulating their access because if you don't then the, the social media will parent the children for you and I like that they did not say um, um, not granting access to internet because no. that's where I would have a problem no, because I know no. that internet children they will use for assignment yeah. but even as a parent even internet access you have to really really you have to regulate it, yeah. because these yeah. children they found ways all of them are doing yeah. coding so if you have a child that is coding, yeah. that means it's very easy for them to take all the access of the phones but and everything is right for social media. But so let me also make says, a point to that. Yeah. It's not just that they're doing coding and they're learning how to get to the back end. A lot of these apps are also not being as restrictive yes. as with, the, be. with the contents yeah. that they have access yes. to. I was going to tell you let about that because you, you kept talking about yeah. that with Kuridi. Can you I say what I heard? To, yes. Kuridi comes to me and she says, Mommy, what is semen? I said, really? where did you see it? My daughter told me she saw it on YouTube shorts when she has YouTube kids. Is that me? Exactly. So, as much as we are telling, as much as we're saying, oh, they're learning yeah. coding, they're the becoming apps. smart enough to work around our parental guidelines, even the apps are not doing enough to keep our kids safe. Yeah, but yeah. That, those are the places that the government can come in. Yes. If you want to operate within my region, 
this and this and this are the things that these are the things I was expect the National Assembly I to be discussing no, 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 no. on. This, this is not. This is not the focus of. It's of, not just of, even of, that the well, National, National, National Assembly now. now. This thing we're talking about. The, the apps are now the, are now somehow enabling. So I I didn't hear. I saw there's a there's an app where um, ladies used to track their their flow. Yeah, the that would suggest to you in the app that uh, one of the things you need to do to ease the pain is to pleasure yourself, and then they would direct you to another app. Another app. So I'm telling you, app, so fact, if you have a 15 year old I app, period, I'm she's serious. going Simple. to get access to that. To that. And then everybody wants, I mean, they don't want the pain. So you, you go to the app that they're suggesting. Like, it's, it's more like a collaboration. Now, they put the link to the app and then wow. they tell you, oh, if you've tried every other thing or you don't use pills or what, what, just try this and then it, it should work for you. And then they put the link to the app. And there are people who have, uh, um, um, I call it, there's something I call it clicky, clicky fingers. fingers. Yes. Fingers. You just click without of even, and you just go there. Like blessing say, th there's a collaboration. It's almost like a quasi partnership with these these people. You 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 are doing your best as a parent to regulate this, but it's as if the forces are working against you. Absolutely. Look at Tolu for example. Your your child is on YouTube Kids. She doesn't have any business getting involved in conversations that have to do with semen. She's exactly. asking me what transgender is because there are it's, some of the children's yeah. the content that's talking about people are able to have different genders. I, I have conversations with her because that is who I am. I'm, yeah. I want her to be exposed and be prepared. But I'm not ready for the apps to introduce this. But mm -hmm. I also think it's important as much... I've said that I believe this is a parenting failure on, on many people's parts, on all of our parts, because it's easy to hand yeah. it to them and say, you know, just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. But we need to work on restricting yes. access, restricting yeah. time. Yeah. The doctors also say two hours before bedtime, stop. Because for young kids... Too much yeah, exposure to social sleep. media affects their sleeping patterns. Yeah. Yeah. And sleep is necessary for development and assimilation when it comes to education. Yeah. So aside from that, we need to limit use of phones and tablets. We also need to make sure in-person gatherings, if you're going somewhere, give me the phone. Yeah. I take the phone. Sometimes we, we go need. to from Surulere to Lekki, she doesn't have her phone. Yes. We are talking. talking. Yes. Yeah. We go to a yes. party, give me your phone. Yeah. We are talking. Parents, I think, I think you know how grouchy the children get are when I just busy. see their phones at the are, back of the car? Are we too busy to have conversations with our children? We too are or here. we are not ready for that? As parents, I think the bulk actually yeah. lies on us yes. as parents. So, so, I tell people, yeah. not, it's not everybody that needs to have kids. If you know, because to have kids, men, hey, you have to be ready here. It's a lot. It's a lot. So I, I'm also going to say that, um, Tolu hinted at that, and I, I'm going to say that it's just like um, creating a vacuum that is not being filled. You have mm. to replace it with something else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of children these days have um, inferiority problems. It's not because they weren't trained right, but it's because they're so used to being behind the keyboards that yeah. they're not used to interacting. Totally. So, yeah. what happened to social interactions? Take them out, play groups. It's not yeah. a cake. It's something that should be done. You should play in the sand. Go, if, if, what is if wrong with the sand? If you're opposed to Where sleepovers, the they, no, they but you know, 24, 24, 24th century parenting, we're excluding Sorry. our children from you're outdoor outside. activities. Yes. We, we played, played sand. With them. We played a while. Kitchen. That was then. We played this go conversation is. The conversation that was <laughs> there. Yes. 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 Where is the sun? Okay, 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 so okay. while we hope that the Nigerian government, in its uh, imp implementation of the said renewed hope, considers um, positive social impact laws like this one as well, we also need them to look at some decisions concerning laws that protect our society's most vulnerable. Now, after this break, we'll look at the ongoing attempt to repeal that Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act or the VAP Act, uh, if you, as you like to call it, and what it could mean for Nigeria. So stay with us. You're watching Jasiri. Don't forget you can be part of the conversations by following us on social media. We're at New Central TV. Now, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition, VAPT Act, enacted in Nigeria in 2015, represents a significant legislative step towards addressing various forms of violence, particularly against women and girls. This act covers a wide range of abuses, including domestic violence, sexual assault, harmful traditional practices, and emotional abuse, providing a framework for, provi for protecting victims and prosecuting offenders. However, there has been a recent move by a lawmaker 
to repeal or amend certain provisions of the BAP Act, citing concerns over cultural and religious sensitivities, as well as perceived overreach of the law. Today, we aim to delve into the implications of the attempt to repeal the VAP Act, the potential impact on vulnerable groups, and the broader societal consequences of such a move. So joining us to have this conversation is Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi, founding director of the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. Dr. Akiode Afolabi, thank you so much for joining us on Just Siri. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting me. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's just let's get into it because this uh, conversation is something we really need to have uh, because of the sensitivity of this particular uh, discourse. Uh, what was the primary objective of the VAP Act when it was passed in 2015? Was there anything in place before it came to be that that act, act probably came to replace or just give us a little bit of history uh, towards um, the enactment of that act? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the bill had a long history. Um, it took about 13 years, wow. Wow. you know, before the bill was actually passed uh, into law. And it took a lot of um, sacrifice and um, um, collaboration from different stakeholders, particularly organizations, uh, women's rights organization. The initial bill was supposed to be uh, violence against uh, uh, women uh, prohibition act that was the initial name for that bill but as we proceeded as uh, civil society organizations under the legislative advocacy on violence against women called lagva coalition on violence against women uh project alert uh one woman uh rapper wakol and other organizations would see that we're working on it uh we realized that the uh, legislatures were not uh, uh the legislators were not um interested in having a violence against women prohibition act so they argued that violence is not only against women so it's also against men they talked about men beating and uh, women beating their husbands and all of that so that led us to a compromise in the bill so we decided to then broaden the bill and call it violence against persons prohibition act and so but it, there were a lot of engagement. Now, before 2003, when this discussion started, uh, you know, Nigeria was just going into uh, civilian rule in, uh, from 1999. So there were a lot of things wrong. Uh, there is a lot of, there were, there were need to decolonize the, the law itself, because some of the laws that we had on rape and other things were actually a reflection of laws that were brought in by the British in 18, 1860 and thereabouts. So, we didn't have like a comprehensive law that would deal with uh, issues of um, uh, crime uh, around uh, issues of violence against women. Yes, there were some uh, uh, laws, pieces of laws here and there. For example, as of 2003, the Cross River State had a uh, domestic violence prohibition law. 2007, Lagos also had uh, domestic, domestic violence prohibition. So we have those, then we have in some places uh, laws around um, trafficking, like in those states, you know, and all of that. But we didn't have a comprehensive uh, law that can. Uh, that can actually deal with those issues at the national level. So the call for, for the, and of course, violence kept going unabated. Mm -hmm. um, Nigeria signed to international instruments, uh, the, and the, also regional instruments like the Protocol on the Rights of Women in Africa, but we can't see that reflections, you know, reflection in our laws. So, and so that led to that discussion and that engagement. So there were a lot of negotiations around the passage of this law. And of course, that led to some of the defects that you know some the the the, 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 uh, the legislator legislator is raising you know so and some of that I would also uh, delve into some of those yes. uh, reflections as oh, cool. as we move along. So that's the background you know to the law. So in 2015, as uh, President Jonathan was leaving, so he, he gave it like a gift you know and so signed that law. And that uh, Violence Against Persons Act, you know, which then became the first comprehensive uh, uh, legislation addressing um, crimes against women and violence against against women and men, you know, in, in Nigeria. So that's the uh, background to the violence against persons prohibition. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Akiyodi Afolabi, for that uh, very, very, um, what I say, comprehensive background of the VAP Act. Now, we've established that the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act 
um, recognizes both genders and of course it was implemented to address some of these societal issues. But one can argue, I mean, if you look at um, a little bit of the history, um, the act in 2015 was, um, it recommended that states take measures to prevent and respond to violence against persons under section 44 of the act and to create a sexual offender register. But since then, there's been a drastic reduction in sex crime and domestic violence arrests. So um, one would ask, has this been implemented at all? Or was it implemented at some point and then eventually be, um, started deteriorating and now is, is literally um, out in the wind? Because we, we don't exactly hear much about, I mean, we're talking about this yesterday, how you'd report someone and nothing is done about it. There's no, um, there's no proper documentation of these um, offenders. So what is the level of effectiveness in the VAP Act in, in present day? Well, um, you know, the VAP Act actually, uh, it's uh, a federal capital territory act. So we need to understand that. Mm. And um, so meaning that other states also have their own uh, VAP laws. Mm. So out of 36 states, about 34 states have passed different uh, shades, some following the VAP Act uh, uh, holistically, others following uh, some dimensions. For example, I think one of the uh, um, uh, most beautiful uh, piece of legislation that came out of the VAP Act is the Equity VAP Act, which has a lot of issues and also responded to all the question that you are asking about uh, reportage. So one of the things that they have done is to bring in that issues of uh, sex offenders register. And if we look at uh, some of the um, offenders that have been publicized have been publicized by EKT state. Mm -hmm. um, so Lagos also has that sex offender to register as a separate piece of law, which is not VAP. So they also do, you know, uh, publication. I think about four states also follow suit, a number of states and one or two. But, you know, if you look at the number of uh, those that have been publicized in the sex offenders register and, uh, and you compare it to the uh, volume of violence, we see that really nothing, <laughs> not, it's very little, it's less than even 0.2% um, of uh, what you would have expected in terms of conviction, in terms of uh, people being in that register and what we see, the data we see and what we experience as organizations that are working on the issue of violence against women. So there are issues around that. There's, a, there's actually a deficit in political will, uh, particularly at the national level. Uh, there are a, a lot of um, um, attempts that uh, one would have expected that would have, you know, uh, led to more popularity of the act, but which were not done. For example, I remember that after COVID, they had set up a committee in at the FCT, you know, that is supposed to support um, uh, um, awareness around VAP Act and also as enforced implementation, but we didn't see much of that in, ta in reality. So they had complained uh, for because you can't you can't be addressing violence against women when you are not putting resources. So there is also the issue of resources. There is also the issue of coordination because this cannot just be done by Ministry of Women Affairs or Ministry of Justice. So there must be some kind of multi-sectoral uh, coordination. So which we were not seeing. So there there were a lot of um, 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 conversation around the need to have the sexual assault reference center, which they, I think they have about three in Abuja and they have in other places. But to what extent have, have, have we also been able to use those sexual assault reference centers? So those were the areas that I think there were some form of development. But in, in total, what we say, the lack of political will, lack of resources, lack of cooperation, particularly from police, you know, frustrates, you know, uh, the attempt to even address you know the problem. So there are other cultural issues, community acquiescence to violence against women and girls, and all of that, that would affect uh, people's ability to be able to report. But by and large, I think the government is not doing enough in terms of their duty to be able to ensure that that law is effective and efficient. And those are some of the issues that we need to discuss, especially now that the senator had brought the VAP back or back on limelight on what we would need to do to make it better. All right, Doc. Um, thank you for that. Because in in your submissions, I was I had some several questions that arose. I was 
looking at, okay, what are the implications of this? What can we learn from this? And which states had decided to remove themselves from the mm -hmm. implementation of the VAP Act. But yesterday, interestingly, we, have a, we had a conversation about femicide in Nigeria, and the VAP Act came up. Choma uh, Agwebo, who is the convener of the State of Emergency, GBV, mentioned that many states have, in fact, watered down the act in the process of domesticating it. So uh, could you take us through what you've seen at the state level when it comes to the VAP Act? Mm. Okay, so let, let me also share that um, the domestication of the VAP law particularly in the Northeast. So I participated actively in that. Uh, uh, once he introduced uh, the act to Bauchi State, and it became the first state where the VAP you know, uh, law was passed, particularly in the Northeast. And so it went on like that. So the experience you know, from Bauchi to Bono to Adamawa you know, and other places, also um, uh, other places where uh, we had also contributed, like Ogun State, Oshun State, um, actually uh, uh, show that there are a lot of things that um, are not clear. One, let me just be uh, clearer. The number of uh, uh, women in parliament affected the understanding of you know, violence against women uh, within the context of that parliament, of the parliament. So that affected the full appreciation of what the VAP act can be at the state level. So, except in, in some states where at that point in time they had some progressive leadership, like in Ekiti State, then uh, Dr. Fahemi was there, the wife was a gender activist, so that helped the Ekiti State. So, they, they actually went to for a very full uh, okay, and add a lot of things. Some of the things that have been proposed now to the VAP Act, they already have it. So we also work with the equity state at that time. So, but in places like Maidukuri, uh, a Bono state, it was difficult to even discuss the issue of female gender mutilation. Yes. There were conversations <laughs> about the Shua Arab who had a cultural um, way of uh, female genital, genital mutilation, they've been do, doing that for over 100 years and they were not ready, you know, to, 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 to move away from that. So there were issues of whether we should pass that bill with that, without the area of female genital mutilation. We were able to pass with them, but if you look at the kind of resistance and if you know the kind of female genital mutilation that takes place in which you are Arab, it's not something that can be discussed, you know, here. You know, so if you look at that kind of resistance, you will know that implementation will be very difficult. So it was more or less like, oh, the women want to, let's give them, but we know that we cannot uh, implement it. So there are several states like that that we have variation. In Bauchi State, after the Bauchi's uh, VAP law was passed, they came back to say, oh, this was a Lagos affair. People came from Lagos to come and pass law in Bauchi State. We would need to uh, take it back to our context. So they were going to remove issues of female genital mutilation, issues of isolation of women, which is very common, yeah. where a husband just lock you up yeah. and say, you can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I take your phone, you can't mm -hmm. go anywhere, I can't speak to anybody, yeah. which is a very common thing. So, you know, they, they removed, they wanted to remove all that, uh, forced eviction and a whole lot of other creativity that was in the uh, VAP law. But fortunately, I think the uh, State House of Assembly, they allow that. So there are different variations. So some compromise, removed and watered down. So we, we saw that a lot, particularly in the northern part of Nigeria, where some of those laws were really, really watered down, you okay. know, to be able to beat up with cultural and religious uh, practices and beliefs. <laughs> okay, Dr. Akio de Afolabi, we're going to go on a quick break, but when we come back, we'll take this to the national level and talk about the senator who's pushing for the repeal of the act and also the implications of what it means if Nigeria was to repeal the VAP Act. Please stay with us. We have a quick break right now. Welcome back to Jassiri. Today we're looking at attempts by the Senate to repeal the Violence Against Persons Prohibitions Act, which is being led by Senator Jubrin Issa of the APC, representing Kogi East. Our guest today is Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi, and of course she's telling us about uh, the moves being made. She's the founding director of the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center. Dr. Akiode Afolabi, now let's take it, as I said before the break, to the national level. Senator Jabrin Issa is making the attempt a second time now. He tried this in 2022, and I think it's very important uh, that people realize that he's pushing to have the VAP Act repealed. 
not amended, but he's asking that it be repealed. And he raised a number of issues uh, concerning the act. And that basically means that the act would then be stricken from the books and no longer have the force of law. So let's look at some of the issues he raised. These include the inadequacy of compensation provisions, as well as economic implications of fines and penalties prescribed in the act. He also raised issue with the instances of derogatory expressions in the act, as well as supposed cases of wrong cross-referencing. He noted that the use of the terms shall and may in some sections of the act do not convey legislative intent. He also claimed that it discriminated against the boy child. And once again, I think it's important to note that this is not the first time that this particular senator has pushed for a repeal of the VAPT Act. He tried in 2022, saying that the law needed holistic reforms. So I would like to get your response to some of the issues that the senator has raised as his reasoning his motivation behind moving to, uh, to repeal the VAP Act. All right. Um, well, the Senator has done it in 2022. It's back again in 2024. And uh, now it has passed. It has scaled to second reading. So as civil society organization, then it becomes important for us to take a critical look about what uh, is intention for that, be, for that repeal, you know, it's about. Now, let's go uh, as a lawyer, let's, let's, let's take it from the constitutional point of view. One, does a, does a legislature, let me use the word legislature now, do they have the right to make law? Yes, that's what the constitutional rule says. So they have a right to repeal, they have a right to reenact, and all of that. So um, it's not out of order if the intention, if it is done in good faith. We have had several repeal of National Human Rights Commission Act, you know, and some of the other acts. So it's important to first clear that, you know, because it's uh, knowledge is important uh, in this kind of thing. Now, repealing the acts, you know, when can you repeal? When can you amend? Now you can you can amend when there are few suggestions that you want to make to a to a to an act. So if there are very few, that's not very substantial. So you can amend the, the any, any act that you want to amend. But you can only repeal when you show that there are substantial uh, amendments that you want to make, which could proper, probably include changing section one, section two, or adding more sections to the bill. Now, the senator had come with about eight uh, items, which he is uh, proposing, you know, to repeal, meaning that he may, in fact, he has amended and is changing the sections already, you know, making it something that is very uh, substantial. So I would rather look at, so those issues that he's raising within the context of the bill, are they really substantial enough, you know, for that consideration for the repeal? Now, let me also explain. So where there is a process of repealing, uh, what happens is that the act will remain until when another act comes in place. There is like, there is no, not going to be a vacuum. So the current act cannot be repealed until uh, it, it is uh, the, the the process is concluded. So the act will remain. So the act to repeal does not negate the existing act. You know, so it, it operates as a process while the act still remain operational. So we need to also get that right. So that should we should we agree with him that there is a need for substantial review of the law, then. It doesn't mean that the law is repealed. And secondly, it's also important to also show, to also state here that the repeal of the National Act does not affect the laws at the state level. It does not affect the state VAP law or the state VAP law. This is dealing with the VAP Act that's operative at the national level at the FCT. So it's important to clarify those. Okay. Now, so what is the tough substance? One of the things that he has done, which for us is water, is going to water down what we have before, is the issue of rape. So he is saying that there should be a minimum of 12 years imprisonment and a maximum of life imprisonment. Whereas the VAP Act 2015 did not make that kind of provision, especially for somebody that is convicted for rape. 
So what will happen with this is that people can make a choice of rather than giving life imprisonment, you know, to the minimum of 12 years. That is a problem. The second issue which he raised, if we go section by section, so he had other issues, the issue of consent and all of that, which shows that it doesn't have the legislation, legislative understanding of the intention behind the rape uh, uh, section of the law. Uh, there is a development everywhere. Sierra so Leone, Liberia, has almost the same thing that Nigeria has with the rape, uh, uh, the provision of rape. So it shows that there is there is a deficit of understanding of the legislative intention behind that section. So that is a minus for what he's proposing. The second area which he's proposing, which is also important, is the area of defilement that he has brought into it. Mm. Defilement was never in that VAP law, and in VAP Act, and it was for a reason, because gradually defilement is becoming an obsolete law, yeah. where you say when a child is raped, it's called defilement. When it's rape of another, it's rape, you know. Uh, so if you see the way he are brought in refinement, he brought it in, then tried to define the uh, the age of a child between 1 and 18, which would have been good in terms of qualification about the, the, change of, the age of a child. But um, bringing in uh, uh, the offender who raped a child, you know, will go for 12 years. So he had different stratification, 0 to 12 as a different 12 years, 0 to uh, 7 years, 0 to, four, uh, to 14 as 12 years and all of that. You know, made a nonsense of whatever intention that he has on, uh, of to include that section on defilement. Because what would expect you rape a child? You should actually go to jail. Some people would yes. even say that you should be castrated and other things. Yeah. So these are some of the things that he's bringing in, which for me are not substantial they are not necessary so if we go by what he has he doesn't have the substantial uh, provisions that would make us to agree with a repeal of the law so mm -hmm. if it is the shah and me that all the word mentally retarded that he said is used and is nogatory those are just simple things that are within a section that can be amended and on the issue of establishment of fund that he had raised mm -hmm. there is already a place in the law that is talking about uh, compensation and rehabilitation you just would probably need to add a subsection to that yeah. you mm -hmm. know to make they thought a section. So for me, I don't think what he has put forward, it's enough, uh, uh, it's substantial enough to make the law nugatory and then to be asking for a repeal. A repeal. A repeal. So Dr. Akiode yeah. Afalabi, you mentioned two things that I think we need to dig a little into very quickly, and that's the, sort of the definition of rape that uh, Senator Issa is putting forth, as well as this conversation around consent. Uh, because in, in doing the research on this, we also noted that the senator was also talking about rape or rather consent when it comes to issues of fraud uh, and issues. Let me, I want to get to it so I make sure I get the right question here. Here we go. Yes. So it has to do with issues of consent obtained by fraud, undue influence, and other unlawful means. So as a society and even with legislation, are we adequately defining rape in a way that we are making it easy for victims of, uh, of gender-based violence and sexual assault and what it may be to seek justice, to come to the judici uh, judiciary, to work with the police? Are we adequately defining rape and are we doing it in the 21st century, when we understand that so many of these definitions have changed. You gave the example of defilement versus rape, defilement for children, rape for adults. So with the conversation around consent and rape, I want us to dig deeper into that because many people believe Nigeria has a rape culture. Mm -hmm. We have a situation it's where we, we, we make it easy yeah. because between the comments, between behavior, so many things are excused and pardoned and then we create a, we create a, a, a space where it's... I don't want to say it's easier to rape, but where we see increasing numbers of rapes happening and things and, and issues of consent. We don't talk about consent a lot. Enthusiastic, must be repeated, must be very vocal. Consent, that's what we need to hear. That's what young men particularly need to be told, that consent is a very vocal yes. It's a continuous yes. It's not one time yes. All those kind of things. Yes, so, so the, the issue of consent has actually gone through, you know, a lot of processes, and of course we also know that consent has also affected ability, the word consent, the way, because at times it becomes like discretionary of who is, uh, what, it can, what consent means, and just as you said, at what point, you know, can you withdraw, you know, your consent, consent you know, so it, it has gotten to a level where, uh, when we talk about consent, even when you you, you think uh, both of you have agreed and you are about, then you say no. You say no. You know, consent is saying in that in that regard. Now, the VAP Act did not 
emphasize so much on that because it also knows that uh, consent has become uh, uh, a tool with which um, with which rape, you know its uh, uh, conviction becomes very difficult. And there are uh, if you look at the, the context or the concept of rape itself, you know it's to establish that uh, it's done by force and all of that. So the verb act deliberately, you know, uh, watered down the uh, the the issue of consent, which was what we had in in other other laws. And if you look at the way rape is defined in verb, verb act, it was not talking about uh, penetration. Some of those things that we had before, you know, the issue of penetration, uh, the issue of um, it must be between uh, um, uh, the, the the female. It must be between the Virginia and, uh, and, the, uh, and the male organ and all of that. So, but he was talking about all that means. So, you know, it amounts to rape. If you have the sexual intention and you put something in my hair, you know, or you do any other thing in any other part of my body. Mm -hmm. We have had situation where by people are not raped by uh, the male organ. You know, they were raped with the butt of a gun. You know, at comfortable places. So, you know, so the, the, the fact has expanded, you know, on such conversations. So bringing us back, you know, to start defining, you know, consent by fraud, consent by this and that, it's watering down. The mm -hmm. whole discussion around rape, which yeah. the VAP Act was trying to, you know, avoid. Okay. Honestly, oh. uh, Dr. Akiyade, <laughs> there's a lot of unpacking to be done here because there's so many definitions that are going out of the window. And before we know what it is, we'll now have to be in court deliberating over definitions when the substantive issue is still at hand. Uh, the next question I would like to ask, um, uh, Senator, is this bill has advanced to the second reading? You are wondering how you even got to the second reading in the first place. Uh, the bill has been referred to the Senate Committee on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters, which is expected to report back within six weeks. What is the civil society doing about this attempt to repeal? Because I do not know who else will be able to like focus on this bill and be able to fight for the people because individually i doubt if it's a cause just an individual can take up and start to fight them on what are the civil societies doing well um we've, we've, we've been convening and having conversations uh, around the the bill we had a zoom uh, meeting of over like um, 300 civil society organizations from across the country uh, we uh, about two days ago we also realized that and so that's why i said there's a lot of caution um, the federal ministry of justice is taking advantage of this uh, proposal by the senator to do an overall holistic uh, review of the bill now, so let me also say there are defects of the bill. Yes, we need to admit that. Yes, because it was negotiated, because it was already done. Um, so one cannot say maybe um, there's no need to review the bill. So there are there are some areas of the bill. So it is possible that at the end of the day, there's going to be a much more holistic bill, but it's not going to go in the direction of the senator because what the senator is asking for, it's going to do more damage, you know, to uh, the whole uh, conversation about uh, violence against persons in Nigeria. So, uh, so we we intend to also engage. Uh, the senator and other senators who are in support of that bill, uh, those who are sponsors of the bill, we are also going to come up with memo uh, to, to also submit to the uh, National Assembly on, on this. So that even if it's going to be uh, a real a, a reenactment, it's going to be done in a manner that we wouldn't take into cognizance some of the things that we saw as a witness of the VAP Act, and that will be added to it. So we are open to conversation, we are open to discussion. But one of the things we are not open to is for you to drag us back to for them to drag us back to 20 years you know uh to 2003 no we're not open to that we are not going to allow that because no matter how uh, uh how the VAP act is today it has actually contributed a lot to uh responding to issue of others at least there is something people can refer to to say yes we have a law and they, if they know how to no, have the, the awareness of it, they can hold people accountable based on that. But so we cannot allow anyone to just throw that away and say that it is not necessary. So the civil society is working on it. We are uh, talking to legislators. We are, we are organizing at state level to meet with the senators and the House of Rep. Member. And you know the process is also long. 
So even if it's passed at the Senate, they will still have to get a concurrence at the House of Reps. So we are also going to engage all this different. But I must tell you that I am also aware that the Federal Ministry of uh, Justice is also coming up with uh, an executive uh, bill in this regard. So we so so it looks like there will be a lot of so a lot of uh, intervention in this regard. So that's why it's important for civil society to have an agreement on what we can accept and what we cannot accept when it comes to the uh, bill that has been uh, useful to the promotion and protection of women's right against uh, violence. All right, uh, Doctor, I, I like that you mentioned dragging us back because my next question is built on that premise. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I understand that in this part of the world, especially in Nigeria, we sort of thrive on technicalities. And so I wasn't exactly surprised by um, Senator Issa's statement because it felt like there was uh, an attempt at intentional ambiguity. Right. At the end of the day, we don't know what side he's particularly on. But one thing that um, I can um, generally talk about is the fact that he mentioned that it kind of discriminates against the men. Now, I, I, I want to believe that in different societies, constitutions and reforms are made um, so, uh, surrounding the pressing issues. And uh, our guest that we had yesterday, uh, Chioma Agrebu, mentioned that uh, according to statistics, one in three women are sexually uh, assaulted, yeah. you know, uh, they, they have a, a, basically there's gender based violence again, mm -hmm. mostly against the women. We're not uh, discrediting the fact that men also suffer mm -hmm. all of this. So, this again, borrowing the words that you said, kind of takes us back because we know what the pressing issues are. And so, um, having to repeal this and mentioning that it kind of discriminates against the men when, in fact, that's the reason it was changed to the VAPP as opposed to violence against the women mm -hmm. prohibition. So, what are the potential consequences? of repealing or amending these um, laws or constitutions against, I wouldn't say against, but how does it affect the women? How does it exactly, because it doesn't, what we're trying to spotlight is gender-based violence, especially against the women, because that's the most pressing issue. Again, this is not to discredit the fact that men also experience that, but how does this now affect the women and then the protection rights for the women in this part of the world? Well, um, unfortunately, the senator didn't come up with any suggestion with respect to what can be improved that would affect the boy child. The boy child, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't come up with any suggestion. So, which also shows that that might be redundant. Just trying to you play to the gallery and get um, uh, uh, people's uh, support in this conversation. Um, the, the word person include both men and women. So meaning that every aspect of that law, you know, will uh, affect uh, both men and women. And he, he mentioned in particular the aspects relating to uh, relating to rape, you know. And so, and if you look at that aspect relating to rape, that has been taken care of. Uh, if he, if he reads it very well, so uh, so I I didn't see him coming up with any suggestion of where, and we have the Child Right Act, so it's not the only law that is dealing with uh, issues of violence against children. So the, the, the Child Right Act is there, which is very extensive about both, you know, boys and girls. So um, coming with that is just trying to whip up, you know, sentiment. So so for me, its own um, repeal is not it, what he's asking for. They are not substantial. They are not substantial enough to guarantee that kind of repair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would throw out a section one. I would throw out a section two. Mm -hmm. You know, they 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 are not substantial. They are not necessary. We don't need that defilement intervention that he wants to put in there. It's going to water down the entire thing, and it's going to encourage people who are into child marriage to 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 go away. You know, with very uh, minimal punishment. Yeah. Yes, it might have good intention with saying that we should increase uh, punishment. For example, the punishment for um, for somebody who put an acid on a woman or a man should not should not be an option of fine. That's ridiculous. So there are some areas like that, you know, that should be thrown out. Or on physical injury, shouldn't be hundred thousand or two hundred thousand. So the amount of fines in the current bill needs to be uh, uh, tweaked. So and if, so if you look at that and also look at the current uh, uh, economic situation, if you have somebody to pay 200000 for inflicting grievous harm on somebody, it might be easy for him to pay and just walk away. Yeah, you know? so, so those intentions, so that's why I'm saying that 
we won't throw away all what he's saying, but the areas that we fail would drag us back, like defilements, or is section one, is section two, it's a no-go area. All we right. will not compromise that those sections around rape, those sections around defilement, we don't need it. They are not necessary. The right. laws that we have are enough to deal with those issues. Thank wow. you so much, Dr. Biola Kyodia Folabi. Thank you for the incredible perspective you've brought to this conversation on the VAP Act. I know news of the repeal attempt may have gone uh, many may have gone under many people's radars, but yeah. the implications could hit close to home for millions of Nigerians. We will keep putting a spotlight on this issue and we look forward to having you back when the Senate Committee on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters reports back to the upper chamber. Thank you once again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be well Thank done. you so much. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And, and as we wrap it up today, we need to remind Nigerians that the VAP Act is the most comprehensive law to date that tackles gender-based violence in Nigeria. It offers a broad range of protections that previous legal frameworks failed to provide. It extends the definition of rape. It recognizes non-physical forms of abuse, criminalizes a wide range of harmful practices, including FGM as well, and forced marriages and spousal abuse. And we all need to raise our voices. We need to let the Senate know that we do not want to Senate that does not value the lives of women, Nigerian women, Nigerian girls, and the most vulnerable in our society. We urge Nigeria Senate not to repeal the VAP Act, but to work with civil society organizations and stakeholders in the space to amend it and strengthen it. A repeal could literally mean death for women, girls, and children in the country, and it means a denial of justice for victims of violent acts. I don't, I, I don't know what else to say. No, I know no. a lot of people have not actually caught wind no. of the conversation no, around no, that no. fact. No. I'm sure we'll have ongoing conversations on it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you for joining us uh, today. Join us tomorrow again for yet incredible discussions here on Jessiri. On behalf of the ladies, it's... <laughs> <laughs>